Welcome to Green Bites, Sustainable Asia's weekly environmental news podcast. I am Bonnie Ao. And I'm Koa Tran. In less than 10 minutes, we offer you bite sized green updates in Asia that we think you should know about. Hey Bonnie, do you want to take a wild guess at which country funds the most coal power plants in developing countries? I don't think this is a difficult one, Koa. China is not only the world's largest carbon emitter, but also the largest coal project investor in developing nations as part of its ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. We're talking here about countries like Indonesia, Vietnam and Bangladesh. Yep, that's correct. A year ago, Beijing pledged to become carbon neutral by 2060. This year, at the United Nations General Assembly, President Xi Jinping announced the country will also stop funding coal projects overseas that contribute to the climate crisis. He said China will, quote, step up support for other developing countries in developing green and low carbon energy. That is indeed huge. Experts describe that as a historic turning point away from the world's dirtiest fossil fuel as China follows the steps of its neighbors, South Korea and Japan, in putting overseas coal projects funding to a halt. Yet, we also need to look at China's internal measures, as the country is still stepping up coal. It also did not deliver its promise in the Paris Climate Agreement to mitigate carbon emissions, as NGOs found that the state-run Bank of China was still the largest single financier of coal projects. Yes, and it's always wise to take leaders' words with a grain of salt. Critics warn that we need to know when exactly China will stop funding such projects, and whether already approved coal power plants will be built or not. This year alone, Chinese companies injected capital in 10 new coal-fired power plant projects in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Indonesia, Turkey, Vietnam, and the United Arab Emirates. It's also worth mentioning that half of the world's coal is burned in China, which owns enough coal projects expecting to last up to 50 more years. It's good to see some world leaders making climate pledges this week at the UN General Assembly. But so far, this does not seem to appease general concerns that still not enough is being done to combat climate change. Indeed. And we can see that as another wave of climate protest is beginning to appear all over the world. Weeks before the UN Conference of the Parties, or COP26, climate summit, activists are once again taking it to the streets, demanding more drastic cuts to greenhouse gas emissions. Youth movements Fridays for Future planned demonstrations in more than 1,500 locations, starting in Asia and the Philippines and Bangladesh before spreading to European countries and capitals. That's the first time a major wave of climate protests has happened in 2019, before COVID, a movement that was spearheaded by Greta Thunberg and young activists. It's no surprise, actually. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, as we've covered in episode 10, released a report warning of further climate change-related disruptions in the future. On top of that, last week, the Pacific Island nation of Vanuatu formally requested from the International Court of Justice, or ICJ, to issue an opinion on the rights of present and future generations to be protected from the adverse effects of climate change, as reported in an Al Jazeera article. Climate change issues are inextricably linked to future generations. How exactly is this option from the ICJ going to affect anything? Well, advisory opinions from the ICJ are not legally binding, but they do carry legal and moral weight. The court adjudicates disputes between states after all, so we could expect this opinion to contribute to the development of international law on the subject of the rights of future generations. And we've seen cases from island nations on the theme of climate refugees already, the issue of having to flee the country due to rising sea levels making living conditions harder or impossible. With low populations and precarious economies, it seems that those nations have a tougher time dealing with climate change. Vanuatu, which is home to about 280,000 people, was wiped off 64% of its gross domestic product in 2015 
after a single cyclone caused losses of nearly 450 million US dollars. So, Koa, I've got some exciting news to share. Oh, yes, I know you do. Bring it on. Right. So, over the past months, our team at Sustainable Asia has been busy preparing a new audio documentary series about marine noise pollution. And it's finally coming out this week. Yes. And this brand new season will be hosted by Marcy Trent Long and Stella Chan. And we thought it'd be nice to have them over here this week on Green Bites to introduce themselves and give us a sneak peek of the content. Hi, I'm Stella Chen. Hi, I'm Marcy Trent Long. We're starting a new season 13 called Asia's Noisy Oceans. It's all about understanding the importance of sound to marine life and why noise pollution in China's southern coast is endangering the Chinese white dolphin. We hope you can join us as we journey through the acoustic world of underwater sea life and talk with activists in Hong Kong and China trying to protect the Chinese white dolphin from the damaging impacts of noise pollution caused by coastline development there. Here are just some of the highlights from our interviewees. Tim Gordon, a marine biologist from the University of Exeter, and Sarah Yip, a marine crusader in Hong Kong. Because so many animals on the reef are using sound that it creates this really loud, rich, diverse soundscape full of, you know, the pops and the crackle of invertebrates and the whoops and the grunts and the crunches of fish. Um, and there's, there's this sort of, it's the loudest ecosystem in the sea, the coral reef. And so you can hear it from some distance off. Uh, and these animals are using that sound to cue in, come towards the reef and decide to settle there. Last year, in May 15, we basically saw like six adult dolphins which is pushing a dead craft body up to the water for more than two hours. They knew the, the calf is dead, but they're trying, six of the adults are trying so hard to push up the calf to try to pretend it's not dead, which is the moment that you really thought about why or how you can help them not to die in Hong Kong water. Thank you, Marcy and Stella, for your short little introduction. This latest series was produced in partnership with China Dialogue. The content will be available on our main Sustainable Asia podcast channel this week. We also have a Mandarin version, which you'll be able to find on our Chinese channel, Ke Chi Xu Ya Zhou. So this is all we have for this week's Green Bites. If you have any new stories you think we should be highlighting, let us know on our social media platforms with the hashtag ShareYourBite. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channels for more content and share our podcast with your friends and family. If you're interested in sponsoring Green Bites or have any comments about our content, We'd love to hear from you. Email us using communications at sustainableasia.co or drop us a line on social media. Our handle is at sustainableasia. Thanks for listening.